So, if you are a fan of golf or tennis, you are probably aware that both of those sports have a senior series called the PGA Tour Champions and the ATP Champions Tour. The idea for both of these series is, is to attract high profile golf and tennis players who have retired from those respective series to roll back the glory years essentially and give fans another chance, or in some cases their first chance, to see them play the game that they were well known for. Football occasionally does this as well, with the likes of Soccer A bringing retired footballers back to play the beautiful game along with various celebrities for a special cause. So some of you will be interested to know that there was a motorsport equivalent of this as well. However, it's not that well known. Not even a lot of YouTubers have talked about this series from what I've seen, which is surprising. In fact, when it came to researching information for this video, it was very hard to find anything about it. Even web archives haven't got that much info. So, I'm going to try my best here with the information I have found. So with that being said, this is the story of the short-lived senior series known as Grand Prix Masters. In February 2005, at an event in Santon, South Africa, a brand new racing series was announced, with the series being officially launched a month later at the Durban Motor Show. The series in question would become known as Grand Prix Masters, or GP Masters for sure. The idea for the series was simple, to bring retired Formula 1 drivers back into a racing car at certain times of the year and compete against each other like they did when they were racing in the past. All the drivers competing in the series would have the same car, which would be built by Delta Motorsport. In terms of the car itself, the design was based on an old Reynard Champ car from the year 2000 and it would be powered by a 3.5 litre naturally aspirated Cosworth V8 engine which would be based off a 90s IndyCar engine and would be produced by Nicholson McLaren. The engine itself would reduce 650 brake horsepower, 10,400 RPM and over 320 pounds plus foot of torque when the car reached 7,800 RPM which in turn would produce a top speed of 200 miles per hour which is around 322 kilometers an hour. The car would be fitted with a contemporary paddle shift, or flappy paddle gearbox as Top Gear likes to call it, simpler technology such as a lack of driver aid, cleaner aerodynamics to allow the cars to follow easier, and brake discs that were made of steel instead of carbon fibre to increase braking distances. In terms of the criteria for drivers to enter the series, they needed to have retired from all forms of open wheel racing, had done two full seasons of Formula 1, had to pass a medical exam, and had to be over the age of 45 come January the 1st of each season. And speaking of drivers, these were who were taking part in the first ever race. There was Jan Lammers, Christian Danner, Hans Joachim Stuck, Derek Warwick, Patrick Tornbay, Stefan Johansson, Jacques Lafitte, Eddie Cheever Jr., René Arnoux, Andre de Crasheris, Ricardo Patrese, and the three biggest ones, which were 1980 Formula 1 world champion Alan Jones, two-time F1 champion and two-time Indy 500 winner Emerson Fittipaldi, and the biggest one in terms of the UK interest, 1992 Formula 1 world champion and 1993 IndyCar champion Nigel Mansell. Italy's Ivan Capelli, Britain's Johnny Herbert and four-time world champion Alan Prost were also scheduled to take part in the series at some point but ended up pulling out for reasons I couldn't find on the internet. Maybe you guys know why they pulled out in the comments, let me know. To make the series feel even more like a blast from the past, the series hired Murray Walker to do the main commentary for the series. The first ever race for Grand Prix Masters, which would be seen as a prologue race for the first ever season in 2006, would take place at Kyle Army in South Africa on the 11th to 13th of November 2005, which at the time made it the first single seater race to happen at the circuit since Formula 1 last went there in 1993. And we are still waiting for F1 to return to Africa to this day. The car did its first shakedown in late September of 2005 and it was driven by operations director for Delta Motorsport, Simon Dawson, who reported that the shakedown was a success despite being too tall to fit in the car, so much so that his helmet was level with the top of the rollover hoop. The following month in October, Nigel Mantle and Reddy Arnoux did their first laps in the car at Pembury, with more drivers getting their first laps in the car later on in the month at Silverstone. In that test, De Cesaris ended up being the fastest, with Dana being the slowest and Tombi becoming the first driver to crash the car. Not an ideal start. But either way, all the tests had been done and it was time for the first ever Grand Prix Masters event to take place. So let's talk about that meeting.
The first two practice sessions of Grand Prix Masters got underway with mostly no issues, with Mansell topping the end of the second practice session ahead of fellow compatriot Derek Warwick and Mansell's old IndyCar rival Emerson Fittipaldi. However, there were some concerns with some of the drivers heading into the first ever race. Before the meeting began, Christian Danner, who was competing in the event, raised concerns about the fitness level surrounding Patrick Tornbay and 1980 Formula 1 world champion Alan Jones, given the amount of weight they had put on since retiring from racing and the fact that they would be racing cars nearing 200 miles per hour, which would put a strain on the driver's necks. Alan, clearly not taking these comments very well, hit back at Christian, saying the only time Dan had seen a Grand Prix podium was when he passed it on the way to the lavatory. Ouch. Despite Alan's best attempt at trying to put Christian in his place, it seemed that Dana actually might have had a point, as after the two free practice sessions, it was announced that Jones would pull out of the event due to suffering from a neck injury, with Jones himself even admitting that he underestimated the amount of fitness needed to be able to withstand the amount of g-force the car was pulling. This eventually led to Allen pulling out of the series altogether and was replaced for the rest of the meeting by the series' reserve driver and the early Chilean driver to compete in F1, Alessio Salazar. In qualifying, which was a one-hour session, Mantle continued his amazing pace during the two practice sessions to take his first ever pole in the series by a massive five-tenths of a second ahead of Emerson Fittipaldi, with Mantle's former F1 teammate Ricardo Patrese just under a tenth behind Emerson in third. Derek Warwick, despite showing some good pace during practice, could only manage six, one thousand behind Andrea Di Cesare's. Despite the 30% chance of rain that was forecast for both Saturday and Sunday, the rain stayed away, and the stage was set for the first ever Grand Prix Masters event. The start procedure for the series would be a rolling star, as seen in IndyCar, which favoured Mansell and Fittipaldi, given their experience in that series, and the race itself would be 30 laps long, with no need for a mandatory pit stop, which would be the same for all the other races they ran. At the start, Mantle and Fittipaldi used their experience of a rolling start to good effect, with Fittipaldi trying a move on Mantle into Turn 1. However, their battle would halt as a result of Stefan Johansson spinning into the gravel, beaching his car in the process, and as a result, bringing out a safety car. Whilst the safety car was out, Jacques Lafitte, who was languishing at the back of the field, ends up slowing due to a mechanical issue, and he's forced to pit. He would rejoin the race, but he would end up a few laps down. After the two laps behind the safety car, the race resumed with Mantle again holding on to the lead ahead of Fittipaldi. Given the nature of the circuit, overtaking was proving difficult, until halfway into the race when Christian Danner went for an ambitious move on Andrea De Cesaris into Turn 4, but ended up clipping the back of him, forcing Danner into a compromised position, which in turn allowed Hans Joachim Stuck to go for a move into Turn 5 and take 6th position. However, this doesn't last long, as Danner repasses Stuck around the outside at the following corner, due to Stuck nearly losing in the back end after initially completing the overtake on Dana. For the next eight laps, Mansell and Fittipaldi break away from the rest of the pack, with them continuing to fight for the rest of the race. Elsewhere, Jan Lammers was holding up most of the pack, and with Derek Warwick stuck behind Lammers, Andre de Cesaris took full advantage of this and caught Derek napping at turn six to grab fourth place from the brick. Christian Dana also tried the same overtake on Warwick up towards the hairpin, but ended up making contact with Derek in the process. The following lap, De Cesaris lined up a move on Jan Lammers and went for the same move Jana tried on Warwick, but unlike Christian, succeeds and moves his way up into four. Lammers continues to fall backwards as his tyres continue to wear out. Back at the front, Mantle and Fittipaldi are once again going into combat, with Mantle doing everything he can to defend Fittipaldi. Towards the back of the field, Jacques Lafitte, who was already a lap down, and René Arnoux make contact at the chicane, with Lafitte suffering from suspension damage and retiring from the race as a result. Going into the final lap, Fittipaldi was still putting pressure on Mansell, trying to pressure him into a mistake. Fittipaldi tried everything to get past Mansell, but in the end, it was not enough. Mansell came out of the final quarter with Fittipaldi close behind to become the first ever winner of GP Masters. Only four attempts separated the pair of them as they crossed the line, with Patrese 20 seconds behind them taking the final podium spot just in front of De Cesaris and Warwick. Overall, it was a very successful first ever race, and although most of it was a procession given the nature of the circuit, towards the end the race came alive. However, this was just the start for GP Masters, as next season would be the first proper test. 
For 2006, the season would consist of five races, all non-championship, and instead of drivers fighting for a title, they would instead be competing for a share of each race's prize pool. And to encourage more drivers to enter, the series reduced the minimum age limit from 45 to 40. The first race of the season would take place on the 27th to 29th of April, and would take place at the Lazale International Circuit in Qatar, just located on the outskirts of the country's capital, Doha. Going into the meeting, Alessio Salazar, after being the series' reserve driver, would become a full-time driver for 2006, while Jacques Lafitte pulled out of the series after just one race. Two new drivers entered the series from Lazale, Italy's Pierre Luigi Martini and Belgium's Eric van der Poel, who was currently doing GT racing at this point and not open-wheel racing, meaning he was eligible to compete in the series. In qualifying, it was once again Mansell who took pole position by three tenths ahead of Christian Danner, with Derek Warwick rounding out the top three. Emerson Fittipaldi, despite his great performance in Kyle Army, could only manage safe. At the start, Mantle, as he did in Kyle Army, holds on to the lead. Four laps later, and Mantle is under pressure from Dana, Warwick, and Martini. Dana tries to go around the outside of Mansell, but Nigel holds on, backing everyone behind him. This in turn allows Martini to sneak down the inside of Warwick into turn two and take third place. Then, a few corners later, Warwick loses the back end and spins, dropping him down the order. A lap later, and Hans Joachim Stuck goes off the track at turn one after colliding with Stefan Johansson, breaking his suspension and retiring from the race. With 17 laps to go, Martini tries to go around the outside of Dana, but ends up running out of road and hands the place to Mansell's teammate Eddie Cheever. Yes, there were teams in this, but they aren't relevant for this video. A lap later, and Chiva, having got onto the podium, goes down the inside of Dano into the first corner, pushing him out wide and taking second place, making it a 1-2 for Altec. 15 laps to go, and Alessio Salazar retires, thanks to a mechanical problem, which after a couple of laps of not being able to clear the car, brings out the safety car. With 9 laps to go, and halfway around the circuit, the safety car lights turn off, leaving Mansell to back the pack up. And because the safety car turned them off halfway around the lap, Mantle gets on the accelerator way before the end of the lap, catching his teammate Chiva napping, which puts him in a vulnerable position into turn one against Dana. Chiva runs deep into turn one, and Dana retakes second place, whilst Martini and De Cesaris come to blows at turn one, after the pair were angry at each other during the safety car period. Andrea beaches the car, and he's out of the race, bringing out the safety car again. The safety car comes in after many laps, and it ends up becoming a three lap shootout. At the exit of turn two, Chiva runs wide with Martini following him, and it allows Eric van der Poel to grab third place. Two corners later, and as Chiva and Martini recover, Warwick goes around the outside of both Lammers and Martini to move up to fifth. Back at the front, Mantle controls the race and comes through to take his second GP Masters win, followed closely by the battling Dana and van der Poel. Overall, a very good race, and much better than Kyle Army, with action throughout the field. The next race was scheduled to take place the following week at Monza. Seems F1 weren't the first to come up with stupid back-to-back -back races between two countries that were on completely different continents. However, this race never happened, as just before the meeting was supposed to begin, the weekend was cancelled due to concerns about noise pollution from the local government. So instead, let's move on to Silverstone, which took place on the 11th to 13th of August. There was a lot of excitement surrounding the Silverstone race, as unlike Kyle Army and Lazale, Silverstone is known for being quite overtake friendly. Going into qualifying, many people expected home favourite Nigel Mansell to take pole position. However, due to an exploding radiator, which forced him into a spin, he was forced to start from the back. Instead, it ended up being Christian Danner who would take his first ever pole, with Stefan Johansson in second, and Derek Warwick third, with the top three only separated by 66 thousandths of a second. Alex Caffey made his debut in this race, and there was talks of Damon Hill potentially entering the race, even going as far as to do a test in the car. However, this never materialised to the disappointment of the British fans. In typical British fashion, the race ended up being wet, and what we would witness would end up being the best ever race GP Masters would put on. During the warm-up lap, Nigel Mantle spun, with people initially thinking he had just aquaplaned. However, when he came back into the pit, it was clear something was wrong, as Nigel complained about the balance of the car. At the start, Stefan Johansson gets the jump on Christian Danner to take the lead into Carps. Going onto the hangar straight, Hans Joachim Stuck spins at the exit of Chapel, dropping places in the process. At the end of the lap, both Danner and Warwick aquaplane at Luffield, dropping both of them out of the podium places and dropping them towards the back of the pack. 
Mansell eventually gets going in the race, but is already a lap down by the time the race starts. Elsewhere, Warwick once again spins, this time at Stowe, and this time due to misjudging his braking and colliding with Rennie Arnoux, forcing the Frenchman to spin as well and forcing Warwick to retire due to a broken wishbone. After rejoining, Mantle was still having issues with the balance of his car as he would spin a further two more times in the race. To add more to the chaos, Dana goes too fast at Maggots and goes straight on. Whilst all that was happening, Chiva, now driving for a different team to Lazelle, went around the outside of Johansson at club to take the lead of the race. Elsewhere, Mansell still having issues with the balance, comes into the pit and goes a few more laps down. Back at the front, Eric van der Poel, after carving his way through the field from 14th on the grid, goes around the outside of Jan Lammers at Stowe to take third place and quickly disposes of Johansson at bridge to move himself up to second. Starting lap 6, Jan Lammers, clearly seeing that Johansson was struggling, disposes of the Swede around the outside of Woodcut to take the final podium place off of him. Towards the back, Patrick Tornbey comes into the pits with a damaged front wing, ruining his race as a result. Meanwhile, Christian Danner performs a double overtake on both Pierluigi Martini and Emerson Fittipaldi to move up to 9th. Further up the field, Stefan Johansson, continuing to struggle, ends up spinning at Maggots whilst trying to fend off from De Cesaris and drops down the order. Back at the front, Van der Poel had caught up to the back of Chiva, but the excitement ends up getting the better of him and Eric runs wide at Cops, losing ground to Chiva. To make matters worse, Van der Poel ends up spinning at the exit of Vale, losing more ground to the race leader. Whilst all that was happening, Patrick Tornbey went off at Maggots, losing a place to Rennie Arnoux. On lap 10, and after many laps of being stuck behind him, Christian Danner finally overtook Stefan Johansson at Stowe to move up to 8th. Whilst that was happening, Alessio Salazar, for the second race in a row, retired thanks to yet again another mechanical issue. Lap 12, and Eric van der Poel catches up to Eddie Cheever, and after failing to pass him at Vale, he eventually gets the move done around the outside of Bridge Corner to take the lead of the race. With 18 laps to go, Mantle once again rejoins the race. However, after another spin at Vale, he pulls into the pits a lap later to fully retire from the race, with the problem later being diagnosed as an exploded rear differential. Elsewhere, De Cesaris and Lammers collide at Maggots, ripping off Andrea's front wing and ripping off Lammers' rear wing and allowing Caffey to move up to third and putting an end to Lammers' race. Meanwhile, Eddie Cheva caught up to the back of Eric van der Poel again and the pair switched places around Abbey. Elsewhere, Martini for the second time spins at Stowe, allowing Johansson to get away, while Stuck, battling with Caffey, goes off at Luffield, and De Cesaris, deciding to continue on without a front wing, goes off at Woodcut, eventually coming into the pits for a new front wing, but ended up being two laps down. With 13 laps to go, Dana, continuing his comeback through the field, passes Patrese at Stowe to move up to fifth. Back at the front, Chiva retakes the lead from Van der Poel as a result of the track drying up. However, we didn't see the overtake because Sky, who were the broadcasters in the UK, decided to go to an ad break during this. Nice one, Sky. With 10 laps to go, Hans Joachim Stuck catches back up to Caffey and takes third place from the Italian, with Dana also following through. A lap later, and at the exact same spot, Dana overtakes Stuck before Maggots to move up into the podium place. It's at this point that due to the wet weather, the race is reaching towards the time limit, and as a result, the race becomes a timed race. With 9 minutes to go, Eric van der Poel, trying to get back at Eddie Cheva, spins at Woodcut and loses ground to Cheva. With under 5 minutes to go, Stefan Johansson, after struggling all day, retires in the pit lane thanks to a mechanical issue. Then, with under 2 minutes to go, any chance van der Poel had at winning the race goes down the drain, as he once again spins at the exit of Vale. However, due to the big gap he has to Dana, he's able to keep second place. Coming out of Luffield, and as the clock reaches zero, Eddie Cheever Jr. comes around the final corner to become the second ever winner of GP Masters. His amazing drive in the conditions gave him the victory, with Eric van der Poel in second and Christian Dana a long way back in third. It was an amazing race filled with drama, action, skill and great battles. Fans had witnessed an amazing race and everyone was expecting more in the final two races. However, there was a problem with that. Later on that year, it was revealed that both the Sepang race in October and the Kyalami race in November had both been cancelled. No one exactly knew why, not even an internet search shows me any reports of these races being cancelled. A free race calendar for 2007 was revealed by the series, which would have seen the series go to Bucharest in Romania, and it was even planned that the cars would switch from a V8 Cosworth engine to a 4 litre V8 Mechachrome engine, which would have seen the power and the res being reduced to 600 brake horsepower 
hour and 9,500 RPM respectively. Given how F2 are coping with Mechachrome, I can only imagine what it would have looked like if GV Masters had those engines. However, when the three races mentioned were inevitably cancelled, it was very clear that something was wrong, and we wouldn't know what that was until later on in 2007. On the 18th of September of that year, it was announced that Delta Motorsport, the company that produced and provided the cars for GP Masters, had filed a petition to the British High Court to put the operating company of Grand Prix Masters into liquidation due to a number of invoices not being paid to Delta Motorsport. The hearing at the High Court lasted for two months, and eventually, on the 28th of November of that same year, it was sadly revealed that the series had officially folded. Even though there were plans from Delta Motorsport to revive the series for 2008 under the name F1 Masters, these plans were never materialised. After only three races in its history, Grand Prix Masters was no more. So what went wrong? Well, the main reason why the series folded was, like with many series, is a lack of money. And the guy responsible for the series not having enough money was the CEO of the series, Scott Poulter. According to Simon Dawson of Delta Motorsports, he claimed that Scott didn't come from a motorsport background, but had the vision of making the series a reality given he saw success with similar concepts such as golf and tennis. However, when it came to financing the series, the structure that was put in place was not stable. Even in the first ever race at Kyle Army, Simon claims that the investors that were involved in the series, alongside Scott, were putting in small amounts of money, and even though the race was a success in Kyle Army, Scott was having to ask for more money from the investors in order to get the race going, given the lack of sponsorship the series had attracted. On the topic of the lack of sponsorship, Simon claims that because of the difficulty of getting sponsors for the series, Scott was having to ask the circuit or the race promoters itself to pay a reasonable percentage to have a race at that circuit. Whilst that practice might be okay for races located in the Middle East or Africa, such as the Lazale and Kyle Army, trying to do that sort of practice in Europe doesn't work, as usually circuits in Europe, such as Silverstone, don't like putting money towards a series racing at their circuit. And given the lack of ticket sales as well, it made it difficult for the series to recover the losses they had when promoting the series. This in turn made it harder for GP Masters to pay Delta Motorsport the invoices they were owed, and with more races getting cancelled, it was very clear from people viewing it on the outside that the series, even though it was under a year old, was on borrowed time, like with A1 Grand Prix and the Super League Formula in the past. It wasn't just money that was an issue for the series, there were also some things within the series that I noticed was also a bit questionable and concerning. The first thing I noticed was the criteria needed to enter the series. Not so much the criteria itself, but more how it was being enforced, or lack of in my opinion. For example, going back to what Christian Danner said before the first ever race in Kyle Army, he raised concerns about the fitness levels surrounding Alan Jones and Patrick Tornbay. Whilst Patrick didn't have any issues in the end, Alan did, as after the two practice sessions in Kyle Army, he ended up pulling out of the race due to a neck injury, which he admitted was because he underestimated the amount of strain the neck would be in whilst driving those cars. However, if we look back at the criteria, it quite clearly states that all the drivers that participated in the series had to pass a medical exam. Given Alan had to pull out because of neck issues, it does make me question whether this criteria was being enforced properly, or whether the medical exams that the drivers were having had any loopholes that made it easier for them to pass the examination. The other thing I noticed whilst watching the three races that was very concerning to me was the commentary. Now, don't get me wrong, I love Murray Walker, he's my favourite commentator of all time, and he's given us some memorable moments, and it's still sad that he's no longer with us. However, I've got to be honest here, I wish Murray had never accepted the role of main commentator. I understand why he was offered it, because given it was a blast from the past style series, it made sense to have Murray do the commentary for it. However, when I listened to his commentary, not so much at the Kyle Army race, but particularly the two races in 2006, it was very clear that Murray sounded breathless whilst he was commentating, so much so that at times, whenever Alan Jones was speaking, or whether there was a pause in the commentary for whatever reason, you could sometimes hear Murray coughing in the background. Given he was in his early 80s at this point, hearing him cough like that was very concerning. Personally, if they wanted to have a classic commentator, they should have gone with one that had the energy to do a 45 minute to an hour long race. 
Overall, whilst it's not too surprising that the series folded from the information I read, it's still pretty sad that it folded as the concept was a very good idea. To have XF1 drivers race again in equal machinery a few times a year to make people reminisce what F1 was like in the 70s, 80s and 90s would be a great spectacle. Whilst this series was poorly executed, I do think an idea like this is still possible. Obviously, it would need to have an appropriate structure to ensure it didn't repeat the same mistakes Grand Prix Masters did, but I think an idea like that could still work today. Let me know what you guys think. I certainly wouldn't mind a series like this to make a return in the future. But like with most things, we'll just have to wait and see what the future holds, I guess.